Welcome, Naima. Thank you so much for coming on Mom's Time Time to Read Books to discuss what's mine and yours. Thank you so much for having me, Zibby. I'm delighted that this copy of the book that I'm holding is mine. So (laughs) not yours, but this one's mine. (laughs) Um, So congratulations on it being a read with Jenna pick and bestseller and all of that must feel so exciting. Is it just amazing? Are you really happy? I mean, I know your last book, Halsey Street, was also like so well received and everything. So, wow. It's it's totally amazing. Um, it's been wonderful to watch readers find the book and was really cool to talk to Jenna Bush Hager for the Today <laughs> Show. So it's been a dreamy experience. feel very lucky. That's awesome. Um, would you mind giving just like the elevator pitch of what this is about for readers uh, who w- or would be readers who haven't read it yet uh, who are listening now? Absolutely. What's Mine and Yours is the story of two families that are brought together when a local public high school becomes integrated in a North Carolina city. One family is headed by a woman named Jade who suffered a terrible loss and wants to make sure her son is able to have a good life despite everything that's been taken away from him and she supports the integration. And another family is headed by a woman named Lacey May whose husband is in and out of her life and she's struggling financially to provide for her three girls, and she chooses to oppose the integration. Awesome. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, you've probably done that a thousand times, but you know, a thousand and one. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. It's good. There's a lot going on in the book, so happy to give a little overview. Um, one of the elements that I thought was particularly interesting was the way you portrayed men. And I know that there's a lot of backstory with you and your your own mother and your daughter and your background, and I do want to talk about all that. But I also think that the way men come across from Ray and how fully formed he was, and then eventually G, G or G, G, right? G, G yes. Um, and even how um, uh, for Noelle's miscarriage, when she's talking about Norman, right? I hope I'm getting all the names right. When you said he's not as unbreakable as he seems, right? Like that the men also have like really big feelings about all of this stuff. Um, So I just kind of loved seeing all those relationships and, um, you know, even Ray being a stand-in father, but not blood father and how that relationship works. Anyway, just maybe talk a little bit about, about men in your book. Yeah, well, it's interesting to hear you say that because I definitely start with the women. Like I started with the mothers, Jade and Lacey May, and I tend to write about women. But for this book, which I imagined as a family saga looking at these two families, I knew that I had to do right by all of the different family members. And I'm really fascinated by how the secrets of people in a family, whether it's things that they're ashamed of or things that they're dreaming of, end up affecting everyone else in the family system, even if it never comes to light. Um, And so one of the pleasures of writing was getting into the minds of each of these characters and revealing them to the reader in ways that they don't exactly end up being known by one another. Love that. Yeah, even just all these little details about them. Um, anyway, it, it didn't take away, obviously, from the women who are the <laughs> central figures. But I don't know, often the men are just sort of like, you know, supporting characters, if you will, right? Like off on the side. And um, they have their own big feelings. And Anyway, yes. I, just, um, I just really like that. So. I'm so glad. Thank you. <laughs> um, so there are a lot of complicated mother, daughter, mother, son, mother, everything relationships in here. And you've written a lot and so beautifully, by the way, in L and time and the cut, like all these places about your own experience. Would you mind talking a little bit more about your own sort of intergenerational trauma and your mother and um, sort of the abuse that went along with that and how your books sometimes are more optimistic because even the, it, the, the idea of finding love is even something that you find hard to imagine and if you will so not to yeah not to go too uh into your personal life to start but anyway if you wouldn't mind talking about it yeah well i am very interested in what gets passed down from generation to generation like the hard things that are transmitted and how people try to find their lives after that um you know something that i hear sometimes from readers is that 
my work is tough or heavy and the lives of the characters are tough and heavy. And that's certainly true in What's Mine and Yours where, you know, one mother loses her partner. It's not that big of a spoiler because it happens in the first chapter. Um, and then another mother doesn't also have support. Um, but I do think a lot about what these characters do have, despite what's been taken from them. And that is love and connection, which isn't something that I always had in my upbringing. Um, so I've written about what it's like to be a mother who is estranged from her own mother. Um, and so I think that I process that in some ways by writing fiction about difficult, messy relationships, but relationships that in some way are more than what I got in life because the flawed and troubled mothers also deeply want to be connected to their children, um, which I think is the beautiful thing and I think is something we assume is universal and is certainly common, but is not everybody's story and is not my story. So I think I'm always writing about children who long for their parents, but I guess the way maybe I revise my life story is there are parents who are also longing for privately and then outwardly really working to be connected to their kids. Wow. At the end of that essay, by the way, when you said you were after the labor and you were holding your daughter and you were like, all I want is just for her to know that I'm here. Oh, it was really beautiful. I mean, oh. the, uh, um, and how you're like so sad sending her to daycare. Sorry, I did like a deep <laughs> yeah, dive into your yeah. life because yeah. I was like, this is all so good. Um, yeah. Well, it was funny sending her off to daycare because, you know, it ended up being different at different points, but at the very beginning, she was just sort of like, bye mommy. I was like, very happy to go. And it was hard for me. One of the things I write about is like, well, she feels secure and stable and knows that the bond is here. And I'm the one who sort of um, feels scared at the separation because of like my own life. So that was sort of a illuminating moment for me. I feel the same way sometimes. I'm like, I know I'm trying to raise independent kids and all, but like, shouldn't she want me to be in the room with her? Like, what do you mean, mom, I'm okay, you can leave? Yeah. Like, what? Yeah. Okay, I mean, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I did a good job then that you don't yeah. want to be with me right this second. <laughs> totally, totally. Um, just curious, do you have any plans to write a memoir? I feel like you have so many personal stories that are, are very ripe for, um, you know, more digging. You know, I've thought about it. I, th I think it's possible, but it's not a solid plan that I have. I mean, I feel very drawn to the fiction because I find that it can be a good way to sift through things that I don't fully understand. Whereas I go to write an essay once I've already sort of finished my thinking about something. Like I never write nonfiction about something that's in progress or fresh. So I find that I have this habit of living through a set of questions and feelings and experiences. And then after two or three years of that, I say, I should write a book. And then I write a novel that doesn't tell my story, but that picks up all those themes and questions. And you wrote about sending your mom Halsey Street and how she didn't read it at first and then she did and um, had just like a pretty horrific response at the end and it caused your estrangement. How do you then go on to write a second book or another story with that as the backdrop? Um, I mean, that's like a very that's a lot of responsibility for a book in, in a relationship, right? With, and of course you did nothing. I mean, it was fiction, so. Right. Well, I think that that's a part of it, that knowing that like the book isn't the actual problem in any way. And I talk about how that book is, you know, rather than say um, slamming anybody, it's like wish fulfillment of mm -hmm. a mother and daughter who find their way back to one another. But I do think it's not an option for me not to write. Um, it feels so connected to who I am and what's a part of me. And I think that the book was just sort of like a cipher for um, being someone who hopes to tell the truth, even if that is, you know, in a converse, in a difficult conversation, in a letter, or in fiction. Like, I think I love writing fiction because I feel that I'm telling emotional truths. And sometimes I need to make stuff up in order to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and yet you wrote this other um, 
essay when you said about writing, you said self-doubt is central to my way of being and my writing is not immune. <laughs> yeah. Do you, still, do you still doubt yourself even despite your success and everything? Totally. Absolutely. You know, I feel that I'm going to start my third book this summer and there's so many things I know about it and there's so many things that I don't know and how could I know? Like books are very long. Like the outline I have on my computer doesn't capture the fullness of the project. And so I feel excited, but I also feel scared that I won't be able to pull it off or figure it out. Um, and it's been helpful for me to know that that feeling is just a feeling and not actually, there's no way predicts what the meaning of the book will be. And, you know, it's something I hear from other writers, including my students, like my students will say to me, I don't know what I'm doing and I feel lost. And I say, sounds right. Like, sounds like you're building a big complicated thing and the feelings are just a part of it, part of the territory. I'm starting to feel like authors have more sort of self-doubt, like they trust the process less than like anybody else in the world. Or maybe it's just because I interview authors all the time. But what you just said about like pulling it off, I think any every author is like, oh, phew, I did it. Like I managed yeah. to do it. And it's like, well, what do you mean? You're, you're a gifted writer. You're, you are going to do it. But nobody has that attitude. It's like this elusive thing, like, did I do it or did I not? Can it come back? Like, where is it from? I don't know. It's like hard to articulate. I, mean, I think the questioning is really important and is partially what makes book have the capacity to surprise us, right? Like if I didn't question any of my choices about the characters or the plot, I don't think that, you know, any of my books would contain those moments that change a reader's sense of the people they're following, you know, or, or challenge expectations. So I think that that questioning actually makes the writing better. Interesting. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit more, um, speaking of, of characters and, and getting to know them more, I feel like, and not to give anything away, but, um, when G ends up, you know, well, in the, after a, I don't know if I can say or not, whatever, not, not that it's a, a surprise, but when he is going through a very difficult time in a very sterile like setting um, and she has to come, you know, rescue him, if you will, and figure out everything. I feel like it showed a different side of her sort of mothering than I had seen previously. Was that intentional or it just like happened or am I wrong? <laughs> no, no, I don't think you're wrong. You know, I think with both of these mothers, I was so interested in exploring what they knew how to give their kids and what they didn't know how to give their kids, which I think is certainly true for me um, and true for so many mothers. So for Jay, G's mother, one thing that she knows how to do is champion his future. So she supports the integration. She wants to make sure her kid isn't left out and has opportunity. And she's fierce in so many ways. But he just sort of experiences that as humiliating. Like he wants to blend into the school and he is already an outsider because he's a young black boy, because he has this difficult family history. He's from the wrong side of town. But when he is hurt, let's say, um, and his mother has to show up to care for him she still basically i think knows how to show her care by like fighting with the doctors and like and her in her internal world in that moment i think is filled with fear and tenderness for her son who she sees has been harmed and she doesn't just want him to you know have a good life and a good job she wants him to be safe and to be well um but i think externally it still sort of comes off as her um being tough and a fighter you know, she doesn't um, take him in her arms. Yes. Interesting. So interesting. Um, did you always know you wanted to write? Like, when did this all, did you always know, like, and, and when you get ideas for characters, which is a totally different question, but um, how do they appear to you? Like, how did Jade, maybe do that one first. Okay. Um, <laughs> like, how did Jade does she appear to you like fully formed? Did you know her in relation to her loss, like in the way that a mom has to grieve? And that's like a whole nother like great, amazing thing you had throughout the book, which is so relevant, particularly now. But um, like, how do they how do they come to you? I think characters come to me through their situations. So they don't come fully formed. I think about the pressures that they're 
under and what they have to carry and then go from there. So for Jade, I knew I wanted to write about a woman who'd lost her partner, who had an ambivalent relationship to the child she already had, but now had to figure out a way to step up and sort of fill the role that her partner had filled. Um, and then for Lacey May, you know, I wanted to write about a woman who felt really isolated in the role of wife and mother and who had to take care of her kids while being in love with their father. Um, and so that situation was interesting to me. And then everything sort of grew from there. Um, but that's how they really start. Like I say to myself, like, what would it be like hmm. to be in this position? Interesting. Huh. Um, okay, so back to my first question now that I'm jumping all over the place. Uh, when did you start to learn? When did you realize that you were a, a lover of, of writing and all of that? I think I knew in girlhood, but... I lied to myself about it for a long time. So, you know, I always had a practice of writing that became more serious when I was in high school. Like I wrote my first collection of short stories in high school, which I printed and bound at Kinko's, you know, I still have it <laughs> on my shelf. But, you know, if you asked me at the time, I'd say, I'm going to be a doctor. And I like did pre-med in college and applied to med school and got in and the whole thing and then deferred one year and then deferred another year because I kept telling myself that writing was something I would do, but I would do it sort of on the side or as a hobby because I felt that I should do something more stable and like recognizable to my family and lucrative and all of these things. Um, and then eventually I just said like, no, I'm going to build my life around the writing and figure out how to pursue that. But it took a while. I think I was maybe 23 or 24. It took a while because I started writing at like seven, but yeah, you know, I was, was still say, relatively early in life. I'm like, it took a while. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> 23. Wow. <laughs> well, now I feel like there's some context for uh, Dr. Henriquez and like his yeah. role in this book. So there's a little yeah. backstory for, for him. Um, yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, didn't you go to Yale? I think I read that. Did you go I there? I did go to Yale. Yeah. I went to Yale too. Yeah, I yeah. know. I was in Davenport anyway. Um, I was in TD. Awesome. I was <laughs> definitely not pre-med though. I, uh, <laughs> it, I took like the one gut science class, electrical engineering or whatever, just to get past that requirement. But <laughs> yeah, I was um, fake pre-med. I was very checked out the whole time. <laughs> um, and did you also love to read? Yes, I loved reading. I was an English and African American studies major so that I could just have books all the time. Um, and books were just such good company to me, you know, like I was a lonely kid in many ways um, at home and at school and books were just a way to feel connected. I love that. Yeah, books are um, I had someone say to me once, like, you can never be lonely if you're reading a good book. And I just love that because yeah. you're constantly surrounded by other voices and feelings and people and experiences and, and all of that. So um, are you reading anything good now? I am. Um, right now I'm reading The Lying Life of Adults by Elena Ferrante. I missed it when it came out. Um, I've had it on my night table for a long time. I just love her. I love um, how wild her characters can be in terms of their emotions and the pitch of their emotions. And I find it really inspiring. I'm always thinking as a writer about how to capture like the heat mm -hmm. of life on the page, um, which is, I think, something I wasn't taught to do. Like, I think I was taught to like write cool and submerge feelings and, you know, avoid melodrama. But I'm actually really interested in showing how people argue and how people fight and have sex and you know, have emotional outbursts. And I feel like Ferrante is great for looking at all of that. <laughs> I was actually, I just, before you interviewed Tia Williams, um, who wrote Seven Days in June and other novels, I told her I was about to interview you. Um, and she was talking about sort of the role of being a Black author and how she wanted to, she, she has all this, does, she worries that it's like too flippant almost, right? That she's doing these love stories and whatever. And I said, I had read that you had said, um, you know, should you be doing a better job at, at sort of creating black joy or were your 
books too dark um, and how there's almost like no happy medium. Like you're yeah. both, you're both like these accomplished, beautiful writers who are like doubting if you're doing it the right way. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I think that there's a lot of pressure on black writers and writers of color, um, just such an expectation for what the narratives can and will do. Um, and it's pressure that no one book can hold. And so I think that, you know, we deserve like all the stories and all kinds of stories, you know? And so, you know, I write from a personal set of urgencies, like things that I want to explore, like intergenerational trauma um, and familial estrangement and how people build their families back up after their dreams are interrupted. Um, and hopefully there are people who want to read about that. And if they don't, they don't have to, or they can read about that and read romance, you know, because we contain multitudes. But I do sort of think about um, that pressure, you know, to produce a story that will be resonant, that will be meaningful. But I can't say that I follow that pressure at all so much as I'm, I feel it and I'm aware of it. Interesting. Um, well, do you have any advice for aspiring authors? I know you've already sprinkled in a lot, which was really great. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I, I spoke to it a little bit before, but I'll maybe this is a slightly different spin on it. I'd say that it's important to know that whatever feelings come up when you're writing are just feelings and in no way reflect the merits of your project. So, you know, I know so many writers who will say like, oh, what I'm writing is trash. And what they mean is that like, it felt hard to mm -hmm. write it, um, which is just a feeling and doesn't reflect anything about the work. And I guess the flip side of that is, you know, having a great writing session where you feel like you're on fire and you're brilliant <laughs> doesn't mean that the work is yet brilliant. Um, but as much as possible, just to treat the feelings as part of the experience, but to try to disentangle them from what's on the page. I think that helps revise more clearly, but I also think it just makes the writing process more bearable and helps you focus less on evaluating what you're doing and just staying in the work. Well, I think that's really good advice for life in general yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, if I could do that with my own feelings about a lot of things, I'd be much better off. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, widely applicable advice. Um, well, thank you for coming on. Not that I need to say this, or I don't mean this to sound in any way like, um, uh, I don't even know what the word is, but I'm just really sorry that your mom did not appreciate you the way you deserve to be treated and loved and celebrated. And um, that's something that's really hard and you write about it with such honesty and soul and heart. And um, I just wish it had been different for you. So I'm sorry. Thank you for that, Zibi. I think it's really hard to like hold that pain, um, which is I think why, you know, as I've written, people are just like, oh no, like maybe things will change or um, she'll come around. So I think it's really important, like not to look away and to leave space for that. So thanks, thank you for mm -hmm. that. Sure. All right, well, thank you. Thanks for coming on and um, good job. Good, I mean, good luck with your with your next book. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Take care, Zibi. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.